All right. So this afternoon, uh, the lecture portion is on an introduction to software platforms. I'm gonna, I will give an overview of some different ones and examples, and then I'll do screenshots of the software that we're going to set up for the run today. Uh, the reason that the screenshots that we have so that I can walk through and give you an overview of the different tools and what's being used and why you would be selecting that option. And then also during the tutorial after the afternoon break, when you set up your own runs, you can go back through those screenshots as a pipeline uh, to start setting up. Okay, so at the by the end of this lecture, you'll understand the principles behind software operations. So how do you go from that mass spectra to a protein database or you know a biomarker used in the clinic? How do we get there? You'll be familiar with diverse software platforms. So what are their different applications? What are their advantages or disadvantages? Gain hands-on experience operating the software and you'll know resources for software support. So the first component, uh, and you can uh, freestyle is on the AWS, it's been downloaded, but if you do not use that or you're using your own, then you can download freestyle. It is uh, free from Thermo. It's one of their uh, platforms that they use or one of their tools they use. And the reason that we use it is to check the mass spectra itself. We wanna check the quality of the experimental chromatograms. So you may set up a run and it's a total proteome, for example, and you wanna see what does it look like? How did it run? What are my samples? You know, are there differences across the samples? Uh, I noticed a water droplet on the spray source at some point. Did that interfere with my chromatogram? And so you can use uh, this software as well as others to view the mass spectra. You can get an idea of ion intensities. You can see potential contaminants that were, are within your sample, as well as any issues with the chromatography. You'll also gain information about the mass spec settings themselves. So the length of the gradient, say you did this experiment three years ago and now you're going to publish the paper and you want to know, did I do a three hour gradient, a half hour gradient, what instrument was it on? All that information you can use as it's stored within the mass spec files, you can open it up in the software and look for that there. So it's good for catching up uh, when it's been a while since you did the experiments. And so this is an example of a mass spectra that you would view. So this is from a cellular proteome. So it would be from probably a fungi or bacterial proteome uh, that my lab generated. And it's a very, uh, very characteristic of what a total proteome would look like in this sense. So you can, the length of the gradient along to the 60 minutes, that's the first uh, piece of information that you can quickly gain. So we know that we ran this over an hour of a chromatography run. At the beginning of the run here, this is when, so uh, Florence during her sample prep talk, as well as when you saw the instruments upstairs, she mentioned the column, the 25 centimeter column uh, or different ones that are available and they're coiled around in, the, in there. And so basically you have your capillary, however long it is, it might be 15 centimeters, might be 75 centimeters, depending on the instrument and the resolution that you want. And you will load your samples onto that capillary. Then a gradient, uh, I believe she went through the different solvents that are used to then elute the peptides off of that uh, capillary. Basically, over time, you put the volume of the solvent in and your peptides will come off the column. And once they come off the column, that's when they're in their ionization state and they go into the mass spectrometer. And so that's what the 60 hours means, is how long is your peptide entered into the capillary, into the column, till it runs in the mass spec and is measured. It's that entire pipeline. And so for the first, depending on the parameters, the first zero to 10 minutes, zero to five, even zero to one minutes, depending on how long the gradient is, is when you're pushing that your sample through the column and you have the solvent coming off. So there's very few peptides that will loot right at the very beginning. And that's why you have this kind of downtime. Then once you get to a certain concentration of your solvent and your peptides are charged and they're present and they're, they're ready for detection and ready to enter the mass spec, that's when you see this peak being formed. And so at any point you can click, so this red point here, if you click at any millisecond of time, you will generate, you can visualize the mass spectra down at the bottom here. And so if you go through and you were to click any other time, this mass spectra will change. And on the bottom, it is telling you the, um, the peptides or the ions that were measured in your sample. And so you can use it and you can think about that top N. This is a DDA approach. So that top N peptides. 
at this particular millisecond, if you looked at um, the abundance is on the y-axis, if you looked at each of these uh, ions, those are the most 10 most abundant are the ones that were likely measured at this time. Then you go to the next millisecond and you would see another spectra as well. And so features that we look for in a total proteome are, are this kind of this quite full map that you want to see across the entire chromatogram. So we have good coverage. We have ions. This is telling us that we have ions coming out at every millisecond and being measured. There's no gaps. So there's no uh, air bubbles or water bubbles. Uh, it's a very rich sample as well. You can look at the relative abundance here and you can look at the intensities over on the side. And this says like a E to the nine, E to the 10 intensity is typically what we expect on these instruments. And so you can just from quickly looking at this chromatogram, you can gain all kinds of information about your sample. And we typically also see this kind of hill pattern because as your uh, solvent, the concentration of the solvent increases, then you have your peptides coming off. There will be an optimal range where most of them will come off, which is really in the this like portion of the chromatogram. And then you'll see a drop off as you have perhaps uh, less abundant or even contaminants will all come off near the end and in the tail portion. And so that's why we use these gradients to help us collect the information, but also to assess what your samples look like. So then for another example, this is an example of a secretome. So it's a very, it's quite different. It almost looks like you don't have anything there, but they're actually, I don't know, we probably identify a couple hundred proteins from this uh, supernatant sample. And so you can see that there's quite a big difference in the profiles because there's less proteins entering into the instrument. So you're still measuring mass spectra at every millisecond, but your top 10, instead of being say 10 out of hundred could be 10 out of 11 or 10 out of 10 that you're measuring at that instance in time. And so that's why it's quite a bit less. Uh, your intensities overall are also less. You, you don't have that same dynamic range. So if you're working with a cell pellet or with a blood sample or something like that, you're going to have a very big dynamic range from the most abundant to the least abundant. In the secretome, much less complex typically. And so you will see a different profile. We can start to see some features that come out at the end here, these that are quite high abundant, and they are actually um, masking the rest of what we see here. So if these peaks at the end were absent or were much lower, then your portion here would be much higher because it's all relative abundance. And these peaks at the end, the fact that they're kind of repeating also gives us an idea that it's likely a, contem a chemical contaminant in the sample. It doesn't have to be a bad contaminant. It could just be something in your sample. Maybe it's a little bit of um, polyethylene glycol that is left over. Maybe it's a little SDS that's in there. Uh, it could be maybe DTT or IAA or components that you use in your sample prep that come out in that wash phase at the end. And then as you click through the different uh, tools or, or windows that are available, you can start to see that you have your, your full chromatogram at the top here. You get the information on gradient length and intensities. You can look at the different uh, spectra at those instances in time. And then you can also set up to see what are the parameters, what is the solvent that was used, the concentration at the specific times, all that information that you would use to um, generate your publication or to compare to another uh, method being used. So that was an overview of what, like, if once you have your raw files, the first step is always to check the quality of them. Uh, if you're loading files into, like, if you want to load files into MaxQuant, for example, it is very common that you will get an error with a file because perhaps it didn't download correctly from the server or it may be corrupted at the source of the instrument or things. So this allows you, if you can open them there, they should run in your software. So it's a good check uh, in that sense, too. So now moving on to search engines. And the whole purpose of a search engine is to process those raw chromatograms and process the output from the mass spec. You want to identify proteins as well as their relative abundance within your samples or across different samples or across experiments. And so the process involves the identification of a FASTA file. This is typically the protein uh, sequence file and I'll, I'll go through that briefly. Then it involves an in silico digestion of that FASTA file, 
So on the instrument, you set up an experimental uh, workflow where you've digested the sample. And now computationally, we need to do a, a in silico digestion with that same enzyme of your proteome to match the two. So we're going to match the experimental output with the computational one as well. Those chromatogram peaks, uh, we learned about the ion detection system earlier. So those peaks, the ions and their output, the electrical signal is converted into the spectra so that we can actually read it. And those chroma chromatogram peaks, they're converted then into amino acids. And then we can read those amino acids as peptides. The peptides are then matched to the FASTA file that has been in silico digested. And typically we set up two unique peptides per protein for identification. You'll see uh, different publications use one peptide per protein for identification. The I would say the gold standard in the field is two. Any more than that is a bit unnecessary unless you know that you have proteins that you cannot distinguish unless they have more than two peptides matching to them. And what that means is that uh, two unique peptides match to the protein sequence, and then you know what it is. They may match to other ones as well, so you need more peptides in order to confidently identify that protein. And the software does help you do that, but then you may also have to go in and look at specific proteins later on. There's razor peptides. Those are the ones that will match to more than one protein, and you need supporting evidence to include them in further analysis. So if, it, if a peptide matched to, say, three different proteins, you would need other peptides from those proteins in order to determine, is that protein actually identified? And there are times where the software cannot distinguish between two proteins that are very similar in sequence because the peptides match to either one. And so typically you'll get identification for both proteins. Uh, isoforms are a really good example of when that happens. So it's the same sequence, but perhaps different function or different modifications. And that will be um, present in your data set. And then your output file is a list of all proteins that are identified and quantified. And in uh, MaxQuant, that's called the protein groups.txt file, but different platforms will use, will have different terminology. And so to the concept behind it is, is uh, de novo sequencing. That's how we go from a mass spectra to actually getting the peptide sequence to mapping to proteins. Is anyone familiar with de novo sequencing? A little bit? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not from your qualifying exam prep. For my students, this is one of their main qualifying exam questions is like de novo sequencing. I think this is the coolest thing ever. I'm like, I'm just going to be honest with you. I took a uh, proteomic science camp at Cold Spring Harbor when I was a grad student and we had someone come in and do de novo sequencing. It like blew my mind. So I'm not sure I'll live up to that expectation now, but I think it's very cool. So the concept is that you have a peptide or an ion that you've put into the mass spec. You're going to measure the mass and charge of that peptide in the first MS scan. Then you need to fraction or fragment the peptide into its amino acids. And those amino, that fragmentation gives you an N-terminus and a C-terminus for every single amino acid. And so the ions that are generated then at the N-terminus and C-terminus have different labels. And so here we have A, B, C on the uh, N-terminus, and then we have uh, X, Y, Z should be on the C-terminus of an amino acid. For our purposes with mass spec-based proteomics, the B and Y ions are the most common ones that we detect within the mass spec. Uh, there are other applications that would detect the others, but those are the ones that we focus on primarily. And so you have your B and Y ions that are generated uh, for each amino acid. So then what your, you've got your mass spectra here. So what the software looks for is identification of those ions. So it will look and it'll say, I think that this is a B2 ion, and then it counts over to the next one. This is a B3 ion. We have B4, and it goes on and on and on. And so you can imagine as a human doing this, it would take forever. And it is very, and like trying to decide which one is an actual ion, which one's background is not easy. So the software will use different features to detect that. On the opposite side then, so you kind of map it with B ions going this way and Y ions going this way. So that it's like uh, gene sequencing. When you have a forward and reverse primer, it's the same concept. We want to map the peptide from both directions, N terminus and C terminus. And so then you'll see that there's also Y ions that are mapped as well. So we've got Y2, Y3, Y4, and Y6. 
And so once the software has labeled which ones are B ions and Y ions, it is the difference between two ions that give you a mass. So for example, we have Y6 to Y7, the difference between them, so this is a mass to charge of 633, this one is at 734. So the difference between them is the amino acid that is measured at that time. So we'll just flip over to this one here so we can match it. So at 101 Dalton's difference, that is a threonine. And so you, the difference, this is labeled as a threonine and we have it up here at the Y7 position. If we move over to Y7 to Y8 and you look at 734 and 881, then you're looking at about 147 or so, I believe. Yes, and that's a phenylalanine here. So that is your F. And so you look for that difference between your B1, B2, B2, B3, B4, and then the same one with your Y ions as well. And that's what will generate your peptide sequence. Right? <laughs> so cool. I think it's so cool. So that's the, that's the concept behind de novo sequencing. So when you see a spectrum now, you can look at it and say, if I could identify B and Y ions, I would know exactly what that is. So that's, that's a good power to have, I'm telling you. Um, the other feature that you can see from this, and we've had a few questions on modifications, is you'll also be able to see changes in the mass of an amino acid. So for example, B3 here also has a B3 peak here. And this difference is about 18 Daltons, which corresponds to water. So that's exactly how the software measures modifications, is it looks for the unmodified peptide or unmodified amino acid, excuse me. So it might be a threonine. And then it looks and it says, is there a minus 80 Dalton loss? That would be a phosphorylation event. And it will then map and see if that is there. So it searches for these modifications if you tell it to do so. The water is a is an inherent part of sample processing. So it will often label those, but you'll almost always see a modified and an unmodified peptide or a signal right beside each other so that you can then confirm that this was the loss of water. When you look for, so when you tell it to look for phosphate sites, then it will essentially look for all the unmodified amino acids, and then it will calculate and look for a modified version of all of them. And if it's present, you will get that information. For uh, glycosylation, for example, if you're looking at you're looking at about a 200 Dalton somewhere around there difference, then that's what the software will do. It'll look at the unmodified version, and then it'll look for a loss of 200 Daltons or more, depending on what the modification is. And and then it maps those, and so you basically take your amino acid sequence that's generated across between each of the measured peaks, and you map that to your peptide, and now you have the peptide sequence. And now you can map this to your FASTA file that, that has been digested and you will know, you can identify your proteins. Yes. On software identifies what is the bar to a B or a Y ion? Yeah, so how does it identify B and Y ions? Um, it uses different features, like whether it's above or like what the background is and how much above and below it. Um, also, whether the whether it's detected like many times over, then it's likely a contaminant. Uh, there's numerous. I know there's a few other parameters as well that it uses to distinguish them. Uh, but those are the, some of the main features. So like measure abundance, uh, if it can map it back within the instrument as well, it does that too. Yeah. Well, you say that the Y ions they have the amine group, yes, but yes. not the carboxyl group. And the A ions they have the carboxyl group, but not the amine group. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's right. Yes, that. absolutely. For whether it's a B or a Y as well, exactly. Yes, yeah. So it's yeah. So it's a cool thing. I think it's pretty cool. All right. So uh, the difference. So that's how how the software will generate. Uh, the peptide list that you can then map to get protein IDs. And we have very we have different examples of software search engines and platforms that do this, and they all have different search parameters. If you took your raw file and you measured it on, say, Skyline, and you measure it on MaxQuant, you will always get different results. If you measure it on MaxQuant today, you use a different version, you will get different results. So that's why making sure you know which version that you're working with and being as consistent and possible as possible with your bioinformatics 
methodology is just as important as your experimental methodology because there's times that you'll introduce variability that you don't intend to. Uh, one sec, when you download your FASTA file, depending on how many proteins, if there's been an update for the FASTA file, that will also, that could also change your identifications. Not by a lot, but by a little. So we'll talk about that too. Yeah, yeah so my question is, so if different versions of MaxQuant give you different results from the same, from the same MS experiment, then how do we know which of the result is correct? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So um, we run our data sets many times, many times through MaxQuant, and we will set it up many different times looking for different things. Typically, people have a favorite version that they work with, and that's what they go with. Um, because there's not much value in testing out different versions if you're coming from, from a biological question, but if you're coming from a technical or a workflow optimization one, then there is. I And so I would say that the major, the vast majority of the results will be consistent experiment to experiment, but you may not detect a modification, for example, something, or you may, uh, maybe a protein is one software only picks it up in two out of the four replicates instead of three. So now you're no longer looking at it. So you do, there are chances where you'll miss things, um, but we always miss things and we always, and we follow up things that we shouldn't. So it's kind of, it's just part of the science, I believe. So you have to make an informed decision when you do it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If the platform, you are working with them, you know, they propose you know, the other software. For yeah. example, for me, uh, I'm in the research institute of Maple University mm -hmm. and I never worked with them, but you know, I heard from the other students are using scaffold software. Right. You yeah. know, uh, and I couldn't yeah. find the name, you know, here. That's yes. why I want to say, okay, for me as a beginner, you know, it's hard to choose, you know, which software or which uh, you know, algorithm. I have to use, you know, to have the most re reliable results, you know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We have to trust on our yeah. facility, or for example, if we could choose by our supervisor, maybe the other software would be better for our project. We have to go and choose that one. Yep. Um, you know, for me, it's yep. important uh, because we don't have any experience. This field, our lab is just wanted to enter in this field, yeah. and you know it's important to just make everything in a good, uh, you know, practice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and following the workshop, you should we we hope you have confidence to make that decision an informed decision, and so there's no. There's no bad software out there for proteomics analysis. I will like if, if it's reputable, which from publications you could see that. Um, the groups that put out the software, they use it for their own labs and then they release it to the public usually, or it's sold to a company. Um, they're great drivers of innovation. So, and and the vast majority of people want you to use their software. So they make it as accessible and user-friendly and um, consistent as possible. So. As a student, a couple considerations. You're right. If you're working with a core facility, they may have platforms that they use, and they're going to be good platforms. They are likely purchased. So Scaffold, for example, is a commercially available one. So they've paid money to have that platform. You will get an you will get an output that you can then uh, kind of tweak, but you can't really like work with the data itself from a Scaffold analysis. There's nothing wrong with that. It depends on what you want. So you could say, I'm going to take the scaffold analysis, I'm going to put it into R and I'm going to generate my own figures. That's great, right? But you're not going to go back and reanalyze that data against a new FASTA file. For example, if you want to say, oh, I want to see if, um, you know, if there's a modification, you won't be doing that. It would have to go through scaffold to do that. Now, the workaround is the facility could send you the raw files and then you could run it however you want. Um, so if you're working with a facility, they, they have a software, they're working with it because they're confident and they know, uh, and it will be a good software. It's, it's, it will, um, but don't be afraid to ask for the raw files politely <laughs> and say like, oh, I just, I'm learning. I want to see how to use it because there's nothing wrong with that either. So the main considerations are cost. So for example, we got a, we have a Orbitrap 240 in, in my lab. And when we bought it, I didn't get the software because um, I'm a proponent of Max Quan and Perseus. That's what I was trained on. So that's what I use. I, but the company's like, no, no, we'll give you a good deal. And I was like, oh, okay. Like I'm a new PI. What it was $30,000 to buy the license. Okay. Like, no, I'm not going to do that. So, cause I can't afford to do that for a software that is free that I can use. Um, 
there, but there are features in it that sure might be better adapted to that platform, but it's not a trade-off for me. It's not worth it. So I use the publicly available ones. Uh, so, so there's many considerations. And I think as, as a student, read some papers on it, see what is commonly used. Uh, look at the, I gave a list of journals, look at some of the recent publications, see what people are using. That's usually the best way to, to get a feel of what is being used. Um, but yeah, there's, there's really great ones available for sure. Yeah. Um, my sister went well, also she's a more bioinformatician. Mm -hmm. uh, she only worked on, you know, RNA seq, you know, yep. uh, you know, methylation, you know, divisional mix, you know, as a yes. and stuff. Yes. And yep. you know, we never had the chance to work on heritage mix. But you know, this is her preference based on you know her experience from you know RNA seq uh, mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. I think she would ask me to receive the raw data. Yeah. And yeah. you know, she was thinking maybe I can do use the you know our packages or yeah. something like that you yeah. know, to reanalyze you know everything yeah. by myself yeah. or you could just yeah. adapt it you know yes yeah. the expectation from me yeah but of course you know as a student if i can use one of these uh, softwares it can make my life a little easier. it'll make it easier it'll make it easier now yeah. but you will be very frustrated later on yeah, <laughs> when you want to generate figures for your paper when you want to tweak something when you want to submit your thesis when a committee advisor asks you what is your fdr and you're like a scaffold told me mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah so it is it is always worth it like honestly by the end of wednesday you will go back to your supervisor and say i can analyze the data using max quant uh, and perseus and i'll get you figures in the next week like you will have all those tools available um and that's the idea is to take from the raw data and work with it so it's it's worth the investment yes i i have to i have to strongly <laughs> recommend that other questions Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, good one. So, how is the um, uh, I know that some uh, providers of instruments they mm -hmm. they have different raw data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yep. how are the interoperability? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I a lot of the software platforms will read from most of them will read from different instruments. Only the commercial ones will read from their instrument. So, for example, MaxQuant, uh, you'll see later when you upload the raw raw files from Thermo instrument, it automatically fills in all the parameters. If you uploaded from a TimsToff or a Toff instrument it, with Bruker, for it'll upload everything. So, all of that um, those features are read by the software when you upload it. Other tools such as uh, MS Fraker and Fragpipe, you convert your files to a common file form uh, and then you upload that. So it's all quite interchangeable and they're designed to work on different platforms. Yeah. You have a question? Uh, yes, um, particularly from Max Planck, I, I was interested because of what you said about the, fragment, the, the in silico fragmentation. Basically, um, I'm working with some samples now that we don't, um, I have already run the max one, and um, but I, I I don't input any any fragmentation type because uh, or proteins we know that they are uh, really degraded since they're uh, uh, yeah. very old. Yeah, yeah. So basically, in the in in max one, we uh, I, I I don't put any trypsin or, or okay or not, yes uh, yes fragmentation step. Yeah. But I was interested in, in if, if if what you said that like uh, the software is trying to match um, the spectra. Of the of in silico spectra with the uh, actual spectra and so, mm -hmm. but for instance, my 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 peptides are already uh, chopped up, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. and uh, and then the the databases that I input are uh, complete protein databases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since we don't know like where the yeah the plots are and so yeah. like is 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 it a, is this a approach correct or, or is it for instance like uh, adding some extra burden computational burden time or so like thinking about yes that. yes so the greater the search space the more the more time it'll take so uh without giving it an enzyme to digest i'm not sure i don't i don't know how it will how it will give you peptides there's ways around this uh, and you can customize and I can show, I'll show you in max quant later, you can customize. So I'm thinking um, Davier at the back, he works on different proteases. So if we want to identify a target, we would digest with that, that sequence, looking for that sequence of the protease instead of trypsin. So you can definitely be more specific in that sense, but your, your FASTA file should have 
I guess otherwise it's it's basically taking one peptide matching to your entire proteome, one peptide to your entire proteome. Uh, you're going to have a lot of false positives, I would suspect. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it might be more of a computational consideration down the down line. Uh, and I can show you some tricks that you can use for for searching it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so some of the examples here. So Skyline is one of the. Uh, it was made. It was created by um, researchers at U University of Washington UW, and it's really a leader in um, targeted proteomics. So uh, we call it either SRM, selected reaction monitoring, multiple reaction monitoring (MRM), or parallel reaction monitoring (PRM). Uh, they're also now moving into DDA and DIA. Uh, it is really, it is an excellent uh, software platform. And for targeted proteomics, it really makes your life easier. It is a great resource. And you can even take your discovery experiments from say MaxQuant or another platform and put it into Skyline to look for um, peptides to use in targeted experiments and it can read it. There's also OpenMS and OpenSwath. These are again, open source. Uh, they're libraries. They're very um, <clears throat> targeted for early adaptation of DIA and swath analysis, as well as proteomics and metabolomics data integration. Uh, and the developers here, uh, Hannes Roast is at University of Toronto and uh, Marie Brune, who is at Sherbrooke University has also worked with this. We have two of Marie's students in the front here. Uh, and so really like community developed uh, platforms, both of them. Then we have Max Quant and Perseus. Uh, those were developed by Jurgen Cox at the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry. And Jurgen was really a pioneer. Uh, he developed these over 20 some years ago now, and really a pioneer in analyzing mass spec data and working with it. Uh, if they are publicly available, they uh, for protein identification and quantification and then visualization. And another feature is that you can uh, develop tools that will take the Perseus output files, and then you can use them in R, you can generate a plugin, there's all kinds of options for that as well. FragPipe and MS Fraker are fairly new software platforms that are being used, and uh, they're they're very fast. They're, they're actually really great platforms in the sense that um, I think the publication for MS Fragger recently came out, but it's been it's been available for quite a while, and they have an amazing uh, help help system too. So you can email them, and they will help you. Most of these are, have really great support services because they're publicly available. They're made for the community. They want the community to use them, so they're there to lower any barriers. Uh, so we use sometimes we use MS Fragger if we just cannot get samples to run in Max Quant. Uh, it is a great tool for us, and we also are moving more into that space. Uh, you can also use DIA, run DIA on uh, MS Fragger and Frag Pipe as well. And then there's other platforms I mentioned here, Protein Prospector, Peptide Atlas, the Transproteomics Pipeline. These are ones that are more for mining sequence databases. If you're looking for protein-protein interactions or cross-linking, or you have perhaps a more specific tailored question that are covered in the other platforms, but maybe not to the same extent that you want, or you, you, know, you really want to tweak something, those ones are available as well. So an overview of, of different ones you can use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're always working on a version for Linux. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always. Uh, same with uh, Max. So when I first like started using Max, they're like, yeah, yeah, we're working on it for Max. <laughs> no, it's been a very long time. So I don't doubt that they are working on it. It's probably more the Linux version than the Mac one. Uh, but they're also working on like a cloud based so that it would be universal to use too. I, I think they more focus on adapting features within the, um, so like data integration, um, DIA has been a big one, cytos like uh, protein protein interactions. That's more their focus than moving it to a new platform. So but do you do it before manage to use it on the Deform Alliance resource? You know what? Um, you yes, in theory you can. I so we tried to do that, and it was actually quite a headache to get it set up. So um, the AWS worked like mm -hmm. a dream. That that but. But it also could be our limitation. It wasn't something like it was something I, we wanted. I wanted to analyze now, <laughs> so we came up with an alternative. But in principle, I would think. And so, uh, when you first start, I uh, when you're going to analyze your data, the information that you need uh, is contained here. So you need to know the species uh, that you're working with, and this can be 
from, you know, someone else I, earlier in the morning, someone asked if the same person does like the experiments measurement on the mass spec and the bioinformatics. Yes, that can be very true. Or maybe you only do one piece or one portion of it. And so you need to know what the species are. So for example, with the uh, raw data that we'll work with today as an example, I had it in my mind that it was from a bacterial pathogen from Klebsiella. So I like downloaded everything, ran it, I went to the output file, and there's like six proteins identified. It's like, okay, clearly that's wrong. So you need to know what it is when you get started. Uh, the FASTA file, I'll show you how to search for them and find them and, and what the features are. And so you want to know if it's available, is the, whole, is the genome sequence available? What is the location of that FASTA file and what is the format of it? You can also build your own FASTA files. Uh, you can modify them as you like. So say you were looking at a, um, uh, I don't know, like a bacteria that you treated with a peptide, you could put that peptide sequence into the FASTA file to like search it. it it's not a static um, document. You need to know the enzymes that are used for digestion, because as we mentioned, those that is how the software knows how to break those proteins into peptides that will match from the experiment side. You need to know the number and samples of replicates. Uh, typically, I recommend across the board a minimum of four replicates, biological replicates for your samples in a standard workflow. If you can do 10 for something that is more variable, like mice or plants, then that is really good. If you're in the clinical space, it's very different. And Florence talked about that earlier. Um, it used to be three was the standard for replicates. And I know RNA-seq, they'll do three. Don't do three. Please do four if you can. It's worth it. Uh, whether there was fractionation done. So if your samples went through a process of fractionation to decrease the complexity, if there was any quantification done, so any labels that were added. Uh, Florence had talked about the tandem mass tag labels that were added. Those will change the mass of your amino acids or the mass of your peptide. So you need to tell the software, we use this to label the peptides, search for that mass change. The raw files, of course, you need them from the mass spec and then whichever software you're going to use. And you need to make sure you have storage space for your raw data, but then for all the output data and all the output files that come from your software as well. So uh, for a FASTA file, uh, this is just a generic uh, example. And so it is a formatted sequence of amino acids is what we use uh, for proteomics. It'll have, the, it'll have an identifier. So this particular one is taken from uh, NCBI. There's always a greater than sign at the beginning. There'll be an identifier of some sort, and then perhaps a gene name or a protein name or a gene ID. And then you have your sequence. There can be other information along the top here. It, it doesn't really matter. You can tell the software to be as specific or as broad as you need it to be, depending on your FASTA file format. So it's all the software will read your file and it'll know it's the start of a new protein based on the, the starting sign, the greater than sign. But everything after that, you can you can tell it how to read the information. And so this is the information that we need um, within the entire FASTA file proteome, you will have however many proteins are in that in that organism. So if it's uh, cryptococcus, for example, it's about 7,400 proteins. If it's mice, you know, you know, whatever it is, you need it'll have that many sequences. And so one of the uh, I would say the most common ones that we use in the lab is Uniprot uh, for for looking for proteomes and for downloading FASTA files. Um, are you familiar with Uniprot? Have you used it? Yeah. Yeah, was that part of the pre-reading? I can't remember now if it was part of it or you've just used it. Okay, that's good. That's very good. So um, you'll go to your, this is the uh, database here, the, the landing page. And then, sorry, if you click on species proteomes here, that's where uh, you can, the kind of the most direct route to get to your protein FASTA file. Although there are other ways as well. And at the top here, you'll see that there's a search bar. And so you can put in whatever it is that you're looking for. So I've searched here for Klebsiella pneumoniae, for example, and it brings up different uh, proteome files that are available, FASTA files that are available. The R beside them refers to them being referenced. And so they have either, um, either they have been uh, confirmed through the Swiss prot or they're validated. Uh, or they are the most up-to-date is also the case. So for example, for mouse, you will see that there will be some that are like gray or, or humans and yeast, ones that are commonly updated. 
the reference ones will always pop to the top. But if you wanted to look at an earlier version, you can scroll down and see those here. Although the links may be broken, it's the gray R, with the little line through it, indicates that it's an older version, but they're typically always available through Uniprod. Yes. So I guess it was enough to notice that um, in, uh, in Word, we can see uh, the, uh, the plugins, um, they're actually there, as you said, they were checked, confirmed, but, but then uh, looking on the G, the description is with this protein, I will see that it is predicted, for example, mm -hmm. homology search. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point, I, I'm a bit confused if I should um, rely on this uh, Brazilian annotation if the, if the gene does not uh, change to the uh, be confirmed still mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you will encounter, especially depending on which uh, biological system you're working with, if there are uh, like hypothetical uh, proteins that are predicted, and the software will tell you that. And so you do always kind of have to be a bit conservative, perhaps, in what you do with that data. I think you can, because in theory, it has been uh, predicted to be a specific protein based on the gene sequence but you don't know, is it actually being expressed? Is it read that way? There's different considerations. And so it is very much a, you may have to do downstream analysis, like search for homology or something like that um, to see if it's if it's consistent. So it's I would say. better to, to still be skeptical. I would, yeah, yeah. I would say like you can download and work with it, but for those predicted ones, just be a bit more like um, robust in your analysis of them. Yes, yeah, and question it a bit, yeah. Yeah, so some of them do keep the isoforms. I think that, um, I believe most of them do, because when you look at the output, you will get multiple identifications for one protein. And if you search them, sometimes they're just isoforms. Sometimes it's redundancy in the database, uh, but they no, they usually do, unless it's some reason it's been cleaned out. But yeah, usually they do. So here's the entry number, the different versions. How we know that is the latest version? This the one latest. here. Yeah, so you can, yes. So the entry number here, typically there may, like if, depending on what you're looking for, if there was a lot of entries, then you could scroll down and you might be looking for a specific species or a specific strain. That makes it a little easier for you to know. Otherwise, you can click on the top one, for example. And it will bring up a bunch of other information. And at the bottom, it will tell you where the sequencing comes from and the date of that publication. I, there's also, you can also see when the idea, I think that's the, when it has been updated as well. And you will see that too. And so if you click on the proteome that you're interested in, you'll get you know, a little bit of information about it. Uh, the number one thing here is the number of entries that are contained within that file. That's a good indicator. So if you're searching, sometimes uh, we have a collaborators that work on bacteriophage. And so then we'll search like the name of it, but it comes up as, you know, six proteins in that FASTA file. That's fine if that's all that's available on here, but we need to know that if we're expecting it to be like 3000 looking at a bacteria and we've pulled up the phage file. So just an important component. And then if you scroll down further on that page, you'll see the different um, the different parts that make up the entire FASTA file. So for bacteria, they may be plasmids. If you're working with like eukaryotes, it could be chromosomes. So if you are only interested in searching one particular chromosome or a plasmid, then you can download just that one. Most of the time for discovery-based proteomics, we're looking at everything. So we download all of them together, but it does give you the option to be a bit more specific in what you're doing. So you'll see there's a download button at the top. You can click on that. It'll give you a pop-up window and tell you it's going to download the FASTA file. I always write uh, no to the compression because then I can open it in a notepad and I can modify it as I like, or I can just view it and see what's there. Even do like a manual search of a peptide if I want to double check something. And then you can download the FAST file. And so when it downloads, then you can open it. You'll see that this is the identifier from Uniprot. So it has the greater than sign. It then has a protein ID. If you take this protein ID, you could search it back in Uniprot and you would get all kinds of information about that protein. So it works both ways. This one then has a bunch of other information, the organism it came from and a protein name and a gene ID as well. 
So it'll have that detail. And then it has the protein sequence here. Uh, I made a couple of notes for best practices in the sense that the top one here is the first one that is the auto download. It is very prudent to add to it. What is the uh, species that you're working with? If that's the case, if you're always working with human or mouse, then maybe it doesn't matter. But if you're working with different uh, organisms, it's good to include that. And then I do like the number of sequences. When you go to publish, the standard, uh, the gold standard for reporting proteomics data is to say the date that you downloaded your software and the number of sequences that were present. Because if someone downloads the yeast proteome in 10 years, it may have 100 different proteins that weren't in yours. So if they search it and then it's not the same or you research your own data, you want to know those sorts of things. The date is now standard in the Uniprot download. That's a new feature. But then I always add in this extra information. Yeah. Is that uh, something that you do by yourself or you have two versions? Ah, yeah. No, I do it by myself. Uh, I'm sure like if you were doing microbiome work and you were downloading a bunch of them, you could have a script that would do that to rename them. But I typically just do it. Yeah. Individually. And then I would get rid of the unlabeled version just because otherwise I'll confuse myself later on. So I do that. Now, if you want to build a custom FASTA file, so I actually have a couple of students in my group that were telling me about how their FASTA files have all this gene ontology information. And I was like, where are you getting those from? Like, that's so cool. And then I was like, we need to have a meeting so you can walk me through this so I can understand how you do it. It took them like three seconds to, <laughs> to show me how to do it. Okay. So um, if you want to bring in other information into your FASTA file, you can, you can search up your, again, this is through Uniprot. Uh, you can search up the uh, taxonomy that you're interested in. So for this one, I've put in Cryptococcus neoformans, and it'll pull up the different proteomes here. If we click on that, we'll get the same information as we saw before. So this one has the 7,400 proteins in it. And you can see the sequence that it comes from and the species, the strain. And then on the, on the side of it are these different features that you can add. And so you can actually customize your FASTA files. So you could add in uh, gene ontology information. It could bring in like biological processes information. You could add in um, known PTMs that are identified, many different columns that you can bring into your FASTA file. It doesn't increase your search space, but it increases the complexity for your downstream analysis. Uh, and that's a consideration for later on if you if you're going to go and you want to see like, what is the gene ontology of all these? What are my go terms? You can bring them in at the very beginning. And so that's a relatively new feature and you just click on the ones that you want and it will then add those columns into your uh, FASTA file. And here over at the end, you can see that there's, um, depending on what you select, the, uh, the database, the table just gets larger and it has now more columns that it will bring into your uh, FASTA file for your proteome. So that's Uniprot. And as I mentioned, that's personally my favorite one I like to work with from there. Uh, but NCBI, of course, is another very good resource. And um, if, especially if you're more in the genomics space, you will use NCBI a lot. Uh, and so NCBI, you can also download a lot of uh, proteomes. So for example, here I searched for Klebsiella and then at the genome uh, here, there's an assembly genome, which I selected. And then it takes you to the genome, the data that is available. Uh, and it has all the different information that's there. And then you can look and see, I think, yes. And so then you can also look, there's a download function and you can select which type of file you would like. And so this is where you get into the question about the predicted because you're working with the gene sequence and it's converting it to the protein FASTA file. It's possible that some of those proteins are not truly being read properly. And so the, the downstream follow-up will be important. But you can also do it within NCBI and uh, get your protein FASTA file and download it. The formatting is a little bit different. So still the greater than sign, it'll have an NCBI identifier and then the name and the organism that it comes from and the strain, for example. But the information is all the same. You still have a name, you have a protein sequence. Uh, it's just the formatting that changes. Here, the output, the download is quite a bit different. So it's very generic. And so I've gone through and I modify the name so that I know it came from NCBI. 
I know that it is Klebsiella, the date, and the number of sequences that are present. And you'll see that the number of sequences in this one does not match with the Uniprot one. And some of that is based on database um, updates or um, confirmations across the databases, whether they are verified, um, different people that upload the different genomes, and then how they're converted to FASTA files. So all those sorts of things. That's why we report it within our methodology. Do you use like both of them for more robustness? No, no. I would select one and work with it. Uh, if you like, you could like you could put both of them together into MaxQuant and search them. But honestly, it's going to give you a headache because then you're not going to know should I trust this one or should I trust this one. Just either one is um, is just as good as the other. So I would pick that way. Oftentimes, if you're getting a protein that is identified. Um, that perhaps is not characterized, you're going to be doing some biological follow-up or some computational follow-up at some point that will give you confidence in that identification. So unless you're just saying, you know, 3000 proteins change, I'm done with my project, uh, you will have other methods of verifying it. Yeah. yeah. Is there any issue with, uh, for instance, redundancy in the databases? Yeah. For instance, uh, I have the case of, uh, let's say, 10 proteins that they differ in 10 amino acids each or mm -hmm. not, not, like an uh, individual uh, variation mm -hmm. or specific mm -hmm. variation, and then I have those 10 data databases. Do, do the existence of this 10 databases, uh, uh, sorry, 10 uh, FASTA files with almost exactly the same information uh, impact the analysis? Yes, yes. So if you bring it, so when um, when we do like multi-species, for example, we have like two or three different FASTA files, but each one is its own like organism, its own biological species. So it so you need it in there. If you had 10 uh, that were say the same species, but there were slight modifications, your entire sample set needs to search against each one of those. So you increase your search space by tenfold. So I would say to either uh, have a master FASTA file. So that's where it's useful to be able to modify. So if you know that there's specific proteins that are different between the different FASTA files, but everything else is the same, take those individual differences and put them into one main master FASTA file so that your search space is only one FASTA file. You can um, label them as you like. So we have a, a plant biotech project where we're looking at uh, nicotania, the uh, proteum of nicotania plants. And then we put in three proteins from a bacterial vector into the plant. So we just take those three seq protein sequences from the bacteria and I just copy and paste them into the FASTA file for the plant and then search it that way. And they have like, I, you can write whatever you want in that identifier. You could write like bacterial proteins one, bacterial protein two then you can identify it. So that would be my recommendation just to minimize your search space and minimize your redundancy and your potential for false positives. Or the, the, the resulting factor will, will be just a, a short, short, let's say like seven, 10 or whatnot. Uh, I mean, as it's that they are, two are different between individual searches. Yeah, yeah. And you also have to consider like, will you be able to detect those differences? You don't know because you can only see in the mass spec what you can measure. So if, you're, if your uh, differences in amino acids are all in one part of the protein and you don't have a peptide from that protein, you will never identify it, that difference. If they're, you know, amino acids that are different, you can, if a peptide overlaps with that from the uh, experiment, you can identify that protein. So you always have that kind of limitation that's present. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, we Copy and paste. Mm -hmm. Is there any special area where you should paste? Oh, ah, okay. That's my my very technical way of doing it. Um, no, no, there you can put it wherever you want. Doesn't matter. But uh, I would either put it typically at the beginning or at the very end, just so I know it's in there. But as long as the uh, as long as it's formatted and you're not interrupting any other sequences, doesn't matter. It reads it as anything else. Yeah. The, the reason of the question is that sometimes in the FASTA files, uh, the, the sequences are arranged according to the, uh, the how the, their position on the chromosome. Right, yes, so yes, yeah. I don't know if yeah. this may maybe in the beginning or in the no. end would disrupt the, 
much. No, it shouldn't. Because the software will take the sequences and digest them irrespective of where they are or anything. It, it's looking at them fairly unbiased. So that was an overview of the FASTA files and kind of prepping them as you get set up and started to uh, to do your analysis. So then you also have your raw files. And I call them raw files. It, they are unprocessed data files from the mass spectrometer. Thermo, that's their, their output name is raw file. So it's definitely biased, but they're unprocessed files. The format depends on the instrument. So we had a great question about like the instrument that's used in the file format. So as I mentioned, uh, Thermo uses the dot raw. Uh, Tim's Toff uh, will, or Brookers will use a slightly different one. Water, Sykes, all different companies will have a different file. Uh, so oftentimes the software will read that file correctly and it'll put in the correct parameters. But if not, there are different, like Freg pipe, for example, requires XML files. There's conversion tools that are freely available that you can convert your raw file to an XML file if you want to uh, run on a different software. Uh, the files can be quite large, so consider your time to download and consider the storage and accessibility. So typically, uh, on a typical run on the on like an Orbitrap mass spec, you're looking at about one gig per sample for a data file. On a Brook or Tim's Toff, it could be 10 gigs per sample. If you're doing DIA, that is also the same space that they would be in around, I don't know, four to 10 gigs. So you want to consider like, how long is that gonna take if you're downloading it from a server? Uh, do I have enough space? All those kinds of things. One caveat with some of the platforms, MaxQuant included, is that uh, when you start running, if you run out of space on your drive of where you're analyzing and the output files are going to, it will just close. It'll just go away and you'll come back to your computer and you're like, but I was running this for like five days and it's just gone because it's given up because you had, do not have enough space. So that is something to make sure you have at the very beginning. It won't give you an error, just frustration. <laughs> so, um, so then getting raw files, that's the next step. So you may have from your core facility you mentioned, you can ask and get raw files from there. Uh, you may also want to look at raw files from a previous student in your lab and you want to do that, you may want to compare your data set to other ones that have been run around the world. And so PRIDE, this is the Proteome Exchange Consortium, is one of the tools that is available for deposition of mass spectrometry data. And so you can go to PRIDE and you can, there's identifiers. So this PXD is a PRIDE identifier. Any good proteomics researcher will put a PRIDE ID in their papers. And if they don't, you can complain about it. This is like the number one thing I say as a reviewer. I like go through and look because the field is very much driven by open data sets. And so it's important to make it available. There's no reason. Yes, exactly. Why wouldn't you? Well, <laughs> many reasons, but <laughs> it is not mandatory depending on the journal. So proteomics journals have a very high standard. And so uh, like journal proteome research, you have to have your data deposited in a publicly available database, but there's, there's different ones available, not just pride. Uh, whereas a biological journal won't require that. You can like contact the author. It's okay, but we're just trying to move the, forward, the field forward. So a PXD identifier will be a pride identifier. You can also search for a specific topic. So if you wanted to look at like cancer humans or comparison of cancer humans, mice, uh, olfactory proteins, whatever you want to look at, you can put it in here. And what it'll do is it'll pull up data sets that include that information. So I've put in one specific uh, identifier that links to the paper that our raw data is from. And so you can see it pulls up the data set. It is publicly available. It says who is who. Uh, deposited the data and what is the experiment. So if we click on the data set and look at it, there's information here, which is typically taken from the paper. Most people will deposit their data when they submit their paper. It's kind of goes hand in hand. So there'll be like an abstract, a little overview of the experiment. There should be a section on sample processing. So you know which enzymes were used, uh, how many replicates there are. There'll be a sample on bioinformatics. So, you know, did they use MaxQuant? What version did they use? Uh, what FASTA files did they use? Those sorts of things should all be contained. But this isn't policed. It is monitored, but it and they are verified to be complete. But any, you can put it however you want. It's pretty free form. 
So it's good practice to be as diligent and as uh, transparent as you can. So if you scroll down through the window, then you will see a deposition of the raw files here, and you can click on the FTP to download them. And so this then allows you to go back and you could research these raw files and you could search them against your own experiments. Say you had very similar setups, but they use different cell lines. That could be a great thing that you want to search for, compare your two data sets. Uh, if you want to look at old data that you published, your raw files are always here and available. There's other files that you have to upload as well. There's text files that you upload in a search uh, folder so that you can also see like the output files that are generated by that analysis. You can go back and look at them here. The caveat to this, and I am guilty of it as well, is the identifier of the file means nothing to anyone. So this is not intentional to mislead anyone. This is, um, I will never say lazy. <laughs> it is convenient to update, to upload fast raw files as they are and click submit because I want to get the paper submitted. So this RS4 will connect to something and you can go through the text and you can see what is that, but really the paper is probably the best way to do it. Uh, or being more diligent, me, and putting what that means. So this is replete secretome replicate four is what that means. So you'll see in the files for the, for the analysis today, we have like L1 and R1 and R2 means nothing. <laughs> so be better than me and put a name. Ah, that's, yeah. Yeah. So would you specify samples that didn't pass quality control? That is an excellent question. Uh, we upload everything. And then, uh, and then within the paper, we may say like such and such a sample was removed because of low protein IDs or something along those lines. But that's our approach. So you can you can do whatever you like. Uh, I'm sure that there's groups that if there's a sample that doesn't fit into the analysis would not upload it because really, you know, you're not going to use it. They didn't use it for theirs. And so maybe it doesn't meet that quality level. So they don't want it out there. Uh, I think either way is probably fine. It just needs to be reported with good diligence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when it has uh, it's a problem with pride that's you know, it has a good form um, uh, it doesn't trade the message intent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for uh, all these experiments and it becomes a big problem problem if someone comes to you, oh I want to reanalyze like the um, meta analysis of ever of everything and then they go to the paper and they don't see this information uh, happened to me. Uh, so um, I came across the tool. Uh, it's actually the, the website. I, I think it's called SDRF Plus, okay. which uh, helps to um, like very precisely mention the meta metadata of all the files uploaded to Pride, and it can be very helpful to people to reuse your data. Ah, oh, so, that's great. So if, if anyone is gonna upload their data to Pride. It's, please consider is your class. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Yes, yeah. So there are, and I should mention too, there's a uh, complete uh, submission and partial submission. So when you go through Pride, there's different ways to upload your data, depending on, you know, how extensive that you're inputting it and the journal requirements and things like that. There's also supplementary components that you can bring into to, to really bring the metadata all together. So different points for consideration. So then one of the biggest questions, and, and many of you have expressed this, is how do you select a software platform? Uh, so the first thing is, what is the purpose and the design of your experiment? If you've done a DDA experiment, then you're going, your software platforms are a bit more plentiful. If you've done DIA, you have a narrower window or a narrow range of software platforms that you can typically use, uh, but they're available for both. So that will help determine which software to use. Whether you've done top-down, bottom-up, or targeted, the different softwares are kind of optimized for each of those. So I mentioned Skyline being very targeted focused. Honestly, if I'm doing targeted proteomics, I'm using Skyline. I wouldn't use anything else because it, that's what it's designed for. Uh, the quantification and modification, most software platforms will allow you to look for all different kinds of quantification methods and modifications. It used to be that some of them didn't read tandem mass tags. Most of them do now. So that shouldn't be a limitation. But if you're using kind of a, 
quirky quantification method, it may not be within the software. And so you might have to customize it. So then can you customize that software? Different steps along the way. Uh, consider your computational resources. So we talked about Linux. Uh, so the operating system that's required, whether it's cloud-based, how much uh, how much you can actually use it and how much you want to. So Peaks is another commercially available software platform. Does a great job, does de novo sequencing, gives you a whole output of beautiful plots, but like I can't go back in and remove this sample without rerunning some of the data or having a license to do that. And so for myself and my needs, I would like to use a different method or a different platform, but it's entirely up to the user. Also, the data formatting. What sort of output files do you have? Do your output files, can you read them within a platform that you want to use? So FragPipe output, for example, can be read in Perseus. So you can you can cross, go back and forth, whereas there may be others that, that don't. So just considerations. How familiar are you with the platform, the tools, the uses of it, as well as the cost of the different uh, software tools? Yes. Um, about the trust of the software, mm -hmm. uh, you were saying this morning that uh, the market uses, mm -hmm. I mean, that's one that we want on the market, but uh, it does run on the on Linux, right? On what, sorry? On Linux. Linux, no, it will, uh, in theory, but no. I, yeah. So it means that we would definitely need yeah. the remote desktop? Either remote desktop or access to a PC, uh, like a Windows computer as well. Yes, yes, yeah. To do it effectively and efficiently. There are workarounds for it, uh, but I find it's not worth the headache, like the headache. So we have a, uh, in my group, we have a couple computers that we can VPN into and run on. So as a Mac user, I just VPN into a Windows computer and I run MaxQuant and perceive us on there. So there's often, there's ways around it to make it work. Um, yeah, yeah. And then others are cloud-based. So then it doesn't matter what you're working with. We have our data on the uh, in Canada or Well, yeah, so with, yeah, yeah. Does that speak to that one? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Just stepping in on, with this question, like, um, I have, um, I have already run it in, in Computer Canada, and it does run. But as as uh, the professor says, like like um, it depends, there are some samples that, that they run really smoothly, and they give you outputs, and you can work with them and everything. But then there are some other samples that they are really frustrating. They never run, and so and so. Yeah. So in my experience, like uh, like it was built for Windows, like uh, but if 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 you have uh, the log or so, like I mean. The resource is there, you can use it. It, it, it runs in Linux for sure. Um, That's, but... good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. I, so now we'll do a bit of a walkthrough of the software itself of MaxQuant uh, to show you some of the features for it. So this is the, um, the MaxQuant uh, website and you can download everything from here. There's also a documentation where you can look and see different like uh, uses of it or different information. And then along the top, I'll also show you there's a resource for the MaxQuant Summer School. Uh, has anyone been to the MaxQuant Summer School by chance? Okay, well, that's probably a good thing because you're here. So that's good. But um, every year they run a either virtual or in person uh, kind of overview of MaxQuant and all of its different uses and applications. It's not a... Um, you know, here's how to set up MaxQuant sort of thing. Like in this workshop, we'll walk you through exactly all the steps. But if you wanted to see the latest and greatest, if you wanted to meet some of the developers, if you had a specific use that you wanted to see if they would adapt MaxQuant to, uh, it's a really great um, resource and, and program. And then they also post everything to YouTube. So I put this up here. So if you're doing something quite complex and you want to know how do I, um, you know, integrate multi omics data sets within Perseus or you know how to set up DIA with Max Quant. you can watch the YouTube videos as well. They're all available from the years of the summer school and you can see kind of what they're doing and how how they're doing it. It can answer a lot of um, kind of those bigger questions, I would say. They also have publications and then the documents as well to help with uh, to help with running of it. 
But I, I, as someone that painfully learned max quant on my own prior to going into the summer school, I didn't learn how to like set up a run going to the summer school. I just learned how it will work once I get it to run. So it's good that you're here. That's the, <laughs> the message. So the, the first step then is to open the software and to note the version. So down at the corner here, I, I always note which version it is. You can put that in, uh, like, you know, write it within a um, text file or something that where all your raw files are housed or included at some point, just so that, that you remember and you know. You can uh, keep multiple versions and you can run them. They update them frequently. Sometimes you can um, get previous ones. Uh, typically for my group, every time someone downloads a new version, we put it into a shared folder so that we can always go back and have those versions available. And so the first step that you wanna do then is to load your raw files. And so you can go to your raw data here and load. It will bring you there where you can select your raw files. And these are the ones that we have available. Uh, and so you just point and click whichever ones that you would like, and you can bring them all in at once. And it will then populate in the table the different files, uh, whether they exist, which I always find kind of funny. It does exist. Uh, the size of the file that you can use to check. If you haven't looked at the chromatogram in freestyle, then you can look here and see if one of them is like, like extremely small. Maybe there's a problem with that file. You can look at the data format. So it will bring in that it's a thermo instrument. So it knows that it's an Orbitrap instrument that it was run on. Uh, this will auto populate from different instruments as well. It will automatically set your parameter group at zero. You can change this if you want to have files run as different groups. So say you had a cellular proteome group and a secretome group and you wanted them to run as different groups, you can set them as uh, zero and one. The experiment here auto populates from the unique identifier of the file name. And so up until the point that it is unique, that's what will come in over here. So we have L1 through four and R1 through four. You can modify these as you like. You can click on it, you can rename them however you like. The fractions is for if you had one sample and you fractionated it. So say you did like size exclusion chromatography or anion exchange chromatography something along those lines, so that your one sample was actually split over eight fractions, uh, high pH fractionation, then your experiment would all be L1 and your fractions would be one through eight. And so you can tell it to do that because then it will, uh, when it's looking for detection and abundance, it maps everything back to that L1 uh, file. If you're looking for post-translational modifications, you can select yes here and you can put in, um, and then later on you can tell it which ones you're looking for. I, one critical piece that, that we do with MaxQuant typically is if you're doing post-translational modification work, you'll have uh, like a, um, let me see, you'll want to have the phospho samples if you enrich them and your total proteome samples. So a really good kind of gold standard is to always match your enriched phospho samples to your total proteome. So that downstream, you know that a change in abundance in the phospho data set is because of phosphorylation or a modification, not because it was high abundant in your total proteome. So you can end up following a lot of um, false positives if you don't do that connection. So you want to normalize your enriched data set to the total data set. So in here, you could load in your PTMs false for your total proteome. And then you could set it as true if you did an enriched uh, experiment as well and ran those samples. It gives you a bit more control over, um, over your abundance levels when you look at them. And then the reference channels, typically if you've done uh, some tandem mass tag labeling and you have an internal standard channel, then you can set it here and it will, um, it will compare everything back to that standard channel as an internal control for your run. So there's different setups that you can do right at the very beginning. Then basically you kind of, you walk through the different tabs. So this, uh, and MaxQuant was designed in parallel with uh, thermo Orbitraph mass spectrometers. So a lot of the components are set up at default because they're already optimized for a standard DDA experiment. Uh, if you're doing a different experiment, a DIA, modifications, anything like that, that's where you really want to go in and change parameters. Uh, and you can, of course, I always recommend people go in and set something up. If you're not sure, should I do, uh, there's a feature match between runs. 
So should I do where I match up all my chromatograms or should I not do that? You may as well run it twice and see what does it do for your data? So don't be afraid to like reanalyze things and ask different questions each time. If you didn't do an enrichment experimentally in the lab, but you want to see if there's any modified peptides and proteins in your sample, you can look for those anyway. You can do it all computationally. So, but you may want to set that up as a different run. So don't be afraid to modify in that sense. So when you walk through the group specific parameters, you'll see here there's different tabs. Type being referring to the labels. And so here you can see we have our labels that are present, the different examples. Um, MexQuant has been very well set up with many different parameters. So most of the things that we do, you can look through and find them. But it also has features to uh, add in customization. So say you've added a label that isn't within this list. You can go into configurations and you can add it in later. Let me just see here. Yeah, so if you scroll down, oh, I want to go back here. So if you look at this group specific one and you can select labels, uh, there's dimethylation, there's TMT labeling, uh, eye track labeling, different ones for quantification. You can select uh, those there. And so here you can see if you walk through, you've got different reporter ions. So where it is, uh, different setups of the instrument as well. If you've used um, TIMS and, and all different things. So you can click on them and kind of see what the options are. Standard would be a typical DDA run without uh, quantification added. The other nice feature is that you can hover over any of these terms and it'll pop up a text box describing what that term is. And so if you're not sure what multiplicity means, you can just hover over it and it'll pop up this box. Uh, many different parts of it will do the same thing. And this is also supported within the documentation on the website, but it's really nice when you're in here that you can look and see what it means as well. So this is setting up the group specific parameters. So just quickly going back, you'll see here, this says group zero. If you put in more groups on the first page when you loaded your raw files, you might have group zero, group one, group two. So you're gonna go through and do these different setups for those different groups. Then we move over to digestion. It will auto-populate with the most common enzyme trypsin that we use, but you can highlight it and then push it back over if that's not what you want. So say you were using chymotrypsin or you're using a combination of enzymes, you can bring them back and forth as you like. Uh, each time you add an enzyme, it will in silico digest your FASTA file, so it increases your search space every single time. So if you're doing trypsin and then you add in chymotrypsin, you now have two search spaces that you need to do all the raw file mapping towards. There's also some redundancy in enzymes. So we typically use lyse C trypsin mix within my lab to improve the digestion efficiency. Lyse C cuts at lysines, trypsin cuts at lysines. So it's redundant to put them both in there. You can just use trypsin and then only have one search space. But some enzymes you may be including more than, more than one. Yeah. I'm not sure if uh, I missed something. So when you need the group name, when you when putting the parameter, choosing the parameters, you can leave it at with group zero. That means that it will keep the same parameters for all the groups, or you can do it separately for each group. If you leave it as group, if they're all, if all the raw files are group zero then you're going in and it'll do them all the same. If you had say eight files are group zero and eight are group one, then you have to go in and set group zero and then group one. Yeah, and likely you, they could be exactly the same or they may be different. You have flexibility to set it up as you like. Yeah. Yeah. So would you have to mention like the amount of trips you're using? No, no, you do not. I That would be more experimental. It's that you're using trypsin. But if you don't use enough, you'll see it on the chromatograms. So that's another reason to check in freestyle. Uh, at the end of your chromatogram, you'll have a huge peak of proteins that weren't digested and they're coming off at the very end. So you'll see that. Um, you Your efficiency may also, if you add too much, you may have a lot of um, like a lot of cut sites out in other places and you may see that in your data too. So yeah. Is that not related to like the in-silico titus like if you're using more than you have more cut sites? Um, 
So you should optimize. So for trypsin, we typically use one microgram per 50 micrograms of protein. That ratio depends on experiment sample size, everything. But that's more of an experimental optimization uh, because the in silico will digest it like at every lysine and arginine, it will cut. So it doesn't, um, it, there are some ways to have it have miscleavages and things, but in theory, it cuts at every single one. So if you add too much enzyme, then you may miss because your peptides might be too small. If you don't have enough, you'll miss things because it's more proteins than peptides. Yeah. yeah. Ah, so if the raw files come from different batches or different days, yes, you definitely can put them all together, but you want to keep in consideration later on, uh, is that the most accurate way to analyze your data? So if we had an experiment we ran in March and then we were running it again in September, I would certainly run everything together, but I would also run them individually and see because on like um, the principal components analysis, if they separate by March and September, there's no point in running them together. Uh, but if they separate it on a biological way, then, then yes. So in theory, yes, you can bring them all together and then you want to be the uh, judge as to whether that is the best way to look at your data. Um, okay. So I highlight this tab here because it's the instrument. This auto populates based on the raw files and it is set up as an optimal run based on the uh, thermo instruments, the Orbitrap instruments. So some of these parameters like the, um, the peptide tolerance, the range that it gives, the window that it's measuring, all that is like default parameters. If you're collaborating, say say your lab collaborates with um, an industry partner and you're tweaking the window size or you're looking at, or there's like a shift in the chromatogram, so they're coming out differently or the ions are being measured differently, then you can go in and change these parameters if you like. So um, uh, that all depends, and but most experiments, they're set up on a standard run, unless you're doing some technology development. And this will also auto-populate with a TOF or a quadrupole uh, based on the raw files. Modifications is another group specific parameter. And so this is where you can go through and specify what you'd like to look for. There are variable modifications. So those are things that can change depend on, depending on the environment. So oxidation, for example, is one of these variable modifications that may or may not occur depending on, on the environment you're processing the samples. And it is auto-populated with a max quant because it's kind of assumed that oxidation of methionine will occur. Uh, acetylation of the, of the N-terminus is also an assumption based on the sample processing. So it's included in there. If you know that they're not occurring in your samples, then you could remove it from the space because it searches everything against each of these modifications. Uh, and then for fixed modifications, those are ones that are like inherent to what we're doing. And so those are populated as well, but you can, you can add and modify to these as you like. I've highlighted phosphorylation uh, as an example. So it is um, put into the software, it's already available. So you can have a phosphocyte on a serine, threonine or tyrosine. If you're working with bacteria and you wanted to look at phosphorylation of histidine, then you could actually, you could customize it to look for that because you just need to tell it, I want you to see histidines, look for histidines and look for this mass shift. And there you go. So you can uh, set up the parameters according to what your experiment is. Yeah. Just, um, I'm just a, a bit puzzled by um when in some steps back, uh, there was one thing to check like for PTMs and so on. Yep. I remember yep. th th during the okay. day that, that, that there are some experiments that, that they're tailored for looking for some PTMs, et cetera, no? like, and so on. And and then I have used this part, for instance, and, in, and I have input some of, 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 of this, but just I'm, I'm watching at, at my setups. And I have this PTM turning to, to, to false. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, just like how do, do this part relate with the other one? Or, 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 or. Yeah, so uh, the feature on the loading files page where you can, it says like PTM yet true or false. That is a fairly new feature, whereas this one has always been in here. And so this, this setup, I would say you can go in and add your modification. 
Now, though, if you want to do that um, relationship between the total proteome and the fossil proteome uh, as an example modifier, so if you want to search the like unmodified, unenriched space and the modified enriched space, that's where you collect. That's where you select true or false on that opening page, because it then the software will read which ones should be modified and which ones are not. Uh, but you don't need to do that. You can also set false, and then you can do it here as well. Either one is is fine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> don't worry. Yeah, that's all good. Yes. So you can go through and add your modification. <laughs> yeah, do you have another question? That's, yeah. yeah. How do you have, uh, customize the, the modification? On the, uh, yes, the yes. I will walk through that as we get to the okay. configurations. Yes. All right, so then quantification is another step. So on that first page on the type, you may add a quantification step if you added a label to your samples. So you have a tandem mass tag that's added or something that is, that is creating a mass shift that you want your search space to look for. The other option is label-free quantification. This is very common uh, way to quantify peptides and proteins. And uh, it's nicely set up because you can always do it retroactively. So if you want to look at your experiments and you want to say, you know, I want to do label free, you can go in and set it up here. It's not an experimental uh, variable that you have to consider. And so here you can click down and select LFQ. It typically has the minimum, minimum ratio count default is two. I, however, over time, as the instruments have gotten more specific, we can now actually do LFQ based on one peptide instead of on two, which used to be the standard. And so we typically change this to one uh, as the default value. It increases your identifications and your quantifications a little bit uh, to, to work with downstream. The rest of the parameters here we leave as default, but again, at any point, you can modify these as they fit with your experiment uh, and your research question as well. So those are the group specific parameters. For most experiments, you'll probably set up one individual group. Uh, and so those will apply to everything. But if you had multiple groups, you would then go back through and do that. So maybe you have a group that's unmodified or that's modified. You would go back in and change some of those things. And, on the, and then the next step then is these global parameters. So these are components that are applied to all files, regardless of which group they're in. And the first one is the sequences. And so this includes the FASTA files. And this is where you're going to bring in your FASTA files. So you can click add here, bring up where your FASTA files are. And you can, so you can choose whichever one you want to work with. It will bring it in here. It will auto populate with an identifier rule uh, based on what it is reading in your file. And so if you click on identifier rule, it will then show you what this means and where it comes from. And so we're working, we uploaded a Uniprot FASTA file. And so the identifier is from Uniprot. However, if you modified your FASTA file and you brought in peptides, like we talked about combining uh, multiple FASTA files together and bringing in peptides, or say you have something from NCBI and you want to put it into a Uniprot FASTA file, you can have it search with just the generic greater than sign, and that then it'll read everything in that file. So it allows you to have a flexibility as to which FASTA file format you're working with, and if you've tailored it at all, you won't miss those, those IDs. So you can do that as well. If you generate your own FASTA file, you can use this setting too. So once you have your FASTA file brought in, uh, most experiments you'll probably bring in one, but you can bring in more than one. Uh, again, it increases your search space every single time. So if you're doing it to compare mouse and rat, you're gonna have a lot of redundancy. If you were comparing like a, if you were looking at a bacteria infected uh, organ from a mouse, then it's really important to have the two different FASTA files so that you can identify proteins from both biological systems. There's then the protein quantification step, the tab, and many of this will carry over from before and it, it's set up to be optimized for what, uh, what you're doing, whether there are modifications to consider uh, beyond the ones that you've already identified in the group specific, you can bring them in here. Under the identification, this is where you can look at the number of peptides. So I mentioned earlier that uh, the gold standard is to have two peptides matched to a protein. The default in max quant is actually one. And so we almost always go through and change this to two. 
so that we have more confidence in the proteins that we're uh, looking at that come out later on. So we don't spend like three years validating a protein that was identified by one peptide that wasn't actually present or maybe could have been mapped to something else. So it, it's better to be stringent here than to spend your time later on doing that. If you uh, scroll down, I think on this, yes. If you scroll down on this page, you'll see there's many different components and parts to consider. Again, you can hover over any of them and they'll it'll give you information. You can also feel free to try them and then see what the output, how it changes your data as well. Down here on the match between runs, this is something I briefly mentioned before. It's a feature within MaxQuant. Uh, lots of different platforms will use this. Basically what it does is it takes features from your raw files, from your, li your liquid chromatography runs, your mass spectra, and it matches them all up. So if you had say 50 samples that you ran over a few days, and over that time, the room the temperature in the room fluctuates a little bit, uh, the humidity fluctuates and your chromatography shifts a little bit. So perhaps you have a few milliseconds, or, uh, like the retention time, the time when your ions come off changes from run to run. Match between runs will will connect all those features and match everything up. So typically it gives you higher protein IDs, anywhere from like five to 15%, depending, uh, but it can also give you false positives. So if you have a infected and uninfected sample and you do a match between runs, it may find the infected components within the uninfected ones because it's matching different features. So it's something I, we typically turn it on and use it because it increases our protein IDs, but be aware that when you're using it, you may have other considerations uh, later on. Yeah. But would it be maybe useful if you want to compare the uh, your enriched sample with the total protein sample? In order to, you know, maybe you are looking for a possible some cross proteins in your enriched sample. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you want to make sure that those proteins were um, present in the total expert protein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would it be would it not be a good feature to keep that type of match in this situation? Yeah. Uh I would be I would try it, but I would be conservative because you may identify modified peptides in your unenriched sample that are being matched because of features, not because they're actually there. But if you're identifying in the modified, like the enriched one, it's okay that you're identifying in the total proteome. So yes, it's an okay thing to do. Uh, you can always go into the output files and you can see if something is identified by matching or by mass spec. So you could, if you were skeptical of something or you wanted to really confirm it, you can always go back and do that too. The output files are quite transparent. And so you can find a lot of different features in there. So then uh, the last piece of this is the configuration tab. And this is where that customization comes into place. And so you can look at uh, modifications, proteases, cross links, as well as other ways that you wanna modify your proteins. You'll see there are many that are already auto-populated and a lot of these come up as features in the tabs that you can select earlier on. But if you had a modification that was uh, specific to an amino acid in your sample or to your protein, or you're using a different crosslinker, or you're using a, like a combination of enzymes that isn't present within here, you can go in and modify it. And so you can select uh, wherever you like, and you'll see here as an example, you can put in the amino acid, you can put in the size shift. If you're looking for a modification that is not in here, you can add in what that shift is and on which amino acid and populate the table. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to adapt to your experimental approach. You just wanna make sure that you remember to click modify table after you've done that and save. So I was at a conference like four years ago or something and a grad student came up and he's like, oh, I work with Max Quant and I keep trying to modify and I just can't get it to mod." And I said, he's like, I cannot figure out how to do this. And I said, did you modify the table? He's like, yeah, I save it all the time. I said, but did you modify it? He's like, nope. <laughs> and so just make sure that you do those pieces because otherwise you will drive yourself crazy trying to get that to work. Uh, so then it'll add your modification at the end of this list. And now within your version of MaxQuant, 
you have that tailored modification. And so it's a, it's a really nice feature to include uh, and you can do that um, and update it as you like. And then it will, if you close it and open it, it'll now be in the drop down menu from before your new modification will be present in there. So once you've got everything all set up, uh, you can, you want to select run or start. You can also change the number of threads. Uh, so if you have a, a high computing power, you want to run quicker, then you can increase this uh, to whatever the capacity is. Uh, standard is usually two to four. The lower, the longer the run takes. Uh, and so you, you kind of weigh those different considerations. And within this performance tab, once you set it up, it will then give you uh, information at each step. So it'll say, you know, checking raw files, uh, um, digestion of the FASTA file, assembly, match between runs, uh, LCMS, different steps as it goes through. So you can monitor it over time. And there's a little green bar down at the end here that will move. And so if at any time it seems frozen, typically just leave it because it is usually working. Uh, if it disappears, that's because they ran out of space or it'll give you an error box. So if one of your files could not be read, if your raw file is corrupt, for example, it'll pop up an error, bo error box as soon as you enter, as soon as you hit start. Or if your FASTA file could not be read, it'll also give you an error box too. I, and so different ways to do that. There's um, there's also a tab here, visualization, I think it's called. It's not showing up here. I It looks really pretty, but I never touch it. It crashes. If you're running and you go to touch this and it shows you all these pretty figures, it crashes. So I just like, I recommend that you leave the performance, let it finish, and then come back when it's done. Like that. That's what it should look like when you're, when you're all done. The output files, uh, it will give you different ones. And so you'll have a combined folder. It'll output a whole bunch of different files with wherever your raw files were stored. It will bring in these different ones. And the combined folder is the most, uh, the most valuable because that's where your search space will be. So if you click on your combined folder, you can have different parameters. You can see the text, fo the text folder, and this is where all your output files are. So within the text folder, you'll have this list of output files. The protein groups is the standard one that we work with in Perseus. If you've done any modifications, anything, there'll be a like a modification output folder. If you wanna look at peptides, all peptides are also released and provided. You can look at that matching and MSMS identification. You can kind of play around with what is there. And there will also be a, a max quant parameter file, an MQ, PAR file that tells you how you set up max quant. So if you want to go back and see which FASTA file did I use, which enzyme did I use, I, any of that information, there is an output file with that information too that is really valuable to keep. So then key tips are to monitor the run, just keep an eye on it, make sure you've got the storage. Uh, never be afraid to rerun data, rerun max quant from changing different parameters, but always change the name of that combined folder. So it will it will override anything that you've put in that is in that same uh, drive with that folder. So just change it to combined run number one or something so that it doesn't override when you set up MaxQuant again. You want to keep your uh, your text folder, the Andromeda search folder for pride upload later on and manuscript submission. Make sure that you have your raw file stored in a server or secure location. Process the files, process file storage as well to keep those so that you, you can keep work with them and analyze them. And then that parameter file, which is what I show here, is really useful if you want to go back and see how did I set up that experiment? What should I expect? All right. 